if we're thinking about the bioactive soy isoflavones, though, um, potentially having some some benefit. I'm I'm of the understanding that as you process soy, um, usually that means that the soy isoflavone content actually goes down, which is um, the opposite, I think, of what some people think. They they sort of think of a soy protein isolate or perhaps a TVP as a very concentrated source of soy isoflavone. So perhaps you can talk to the amount of soy isoflavones in in different sort of common soy foods. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I mean, you're right. It, it, I think people people often uh, get it 180 degrees wrong. Um, so in a traditional soy food like tofu, soybeans, edamame. There are approximately three to four gram, three to four milligrams of isoflavones per gram of protein. So, if you think of a cup of soy milk as having, let's say, seven grams of protein, eight grams of protein, then you can estimate isoflavone content pretty well. So it'd be seven or eight times three and a half, about twenty-five milligrams. So I like to think of a serving of soy as providing about twenty-five milligrams of isoflavones. I mentioned before that in Japan, typical isoflavone intake among older men and women is about 40 milligrams per day. So that'd be about one and a half servings per day on average. Now, of course, you have at the higher end of the spectrum, you have people consuming two and three servings a day, but the average is about one and a half. So it's about three to four milligrams of isoflavones per gram of protein. Whereas in these more concentrated sources of protein, uh, such as soy protein isolate and soy protein concentrate. By definition, they're 90% protein and 65% protein. So you take the bean, in the case of the isolate, you take the bean, you get rid of the uh, the fiber, for the most part, the carbohydrate and the fat, you're left mostly with the protein. With the concentrate, it's about 65% protein. So those products, when they're made in the typical way, um, end up having about maybe 10 to 20 percent of the isoflavone content that you would find in a traditional soy food when expressed on a milligram per gram protein basis. So if you're consuming eight grams of soy protein isolate, in most instances, you know, you you may only be getting geez, anywhere from two to you know, maybe wouldn't even be eight in most instances, but let's say two to eight milligrams of isoflavones. If you're consuming eight grams of soy protein isolate, if you're consuming eight grams of uh, protein from soy milk, you're getting about 25. So the, and what you often see, and you, you reference this or alluded to it, is you often see people saying when they're writing about the concerns about isoflavones, they'll say, well, consuming soy foods is okay but stay away from the concentrated sources like soy protein, concentrate and soy protein isolate. And those are the ones that are actually low in isoflavone. So the Impossible Burger has two milligrams of isoflavones, you know, which is nothing. I mean, you know, there's 25 milligrams in a cup of soy milk. So if for whatever reason you um, were concerned about isoflavones, and again, I don't think there's any reason to be that the human day are very supportive of safety. The FDA reached that conclusion. The European Food Safety Authority reached that conclusion. Um, but if you are concerned about isoflavones, what you would actually want to eat are these products made with these concentrated sources of, of protein. So I look at those foods primarily as sources of protein. Now, the clinical, many of the clinical studies, uh, in fact, almost all of them, <laughs> actually have used the soy protein isolate and concentrate because in a Western population, if you're doing a six-month study, it's difficult to ask someone to consume two servings of tofu per day who is not used to eating that type of food. Whereas with the soy protein isolate, you can put it in a beverage, you know, add it to orange juice or any other beverage. You can actually use it to, to bake with. And then you can take a protein like whey or casein as a control protein. So the participants won't know which, which food they're consuming. If you're eating tofu, you're almost certainly not going to be blinded. You're going to know you're eating tofu. So most of the clinical work has been done with the concentrated sources of soy protein. And those are the products that have shown a reduction in LDL cholesterol levels. So 
Um, you know, I again, if you're looking for isoflavones, you go to traditional soy foods. If you're only concerned about protein, you can eat the traditional foods or the, the foods like the Impossible Burger. Where does TVP fall? That actually is, yeah, that's soy flour, and that would be rich in isoflavones because that, if you're looking at TVP made from uh, soy flour, which is 50% um, uh, protein, that's really just a, a defatted product, and that would be a product that would have a lot of isoflavones. Just remind folks, so what's what would you say is the safe upper limit of soy isoflavone intake per day? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that. So in free living populations in, in let's say, Shanghai is a really high soy consuming region within China. Uh, I, I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that not all regions in China actually consumes much soy. I mean, some consume almost no soy. It's very heterogeneous in terms of their, their dietary uh, pattern. But Shanghai is a, you know, obviously an urban area, very high soy, soy consuming population. Um, they're consuming about 40 milligrams, 35 to 40 milligrams on average. But um, there is a segment of the population, like 10% of the population that's consuming about 100 milligrams of isoflavones per day, which is about four servings of traditional soy foods. So my, um, my basis for the limiting isoflavone upper limit is 100 milligrams per day for two reasons. One, um, there's no historical precedent for consuming more than that, you know, based from J Japanese population or, or Chinese population. Second, if you're getting 100 milligrams of isoflavones from soy foods, it means you're consuming at least four servings per day. And there's you you don't want to consume more than four servings of any, I mean, anything. It, no one would say you should consume more servings, more than four servings of broccoli or kale. Everybody loves kale. It's a great, healthful food. But you don't, you know, you want to you want to consume some some kale, a variety of different vegetables. So it my upper limit is not based on safety concerns. It's based on the dietetic principles of you know variation and moderation. And 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 when you look at the clinical studies, some of them had like there was a bone study from Taiwan. 300 milligrams of isoflavones for two years, no adverse effects. So you have data to show that isoflavone exposure beyond 100 milligrams is, is perfectly safe. But when you're thinking about a food, again, variety and moderation. Right. Okay. So 100 milligrams a day as a kind of general principle. I might put I might put a table into the show notes then that that shows for the different types of soy foods on a per serve basis the approximate amount of soy isoflavones and then people can get a, a feel for what that might look like uh, a day on their plate kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 